I really want to make sure that, uh, that we have some time for Q&A, so I'm going to speak uh, fairly briefly and then uh, like 15 minutes for Q&A, does that sound good? Um, so actually, I'm deciding if I want to, you know what, I'm going to skip the slides. Um, so I'm good. Uh, so first, I just want to, you know, I'm excited to be here. Uh, it's good to be back in Houston. Um, it's been about a year since, uh, since I left. And, uh, what I'd like to do is just talk a little bit about what the Achievement School District is and then how we're thinking about creating a new type of school district that is um, in a lot of ways modeled after a lot of the principles that, that Nina just laid out. And before I do that, I just, you know, when I decided to, uh, to leave Yes Prep and take this job, and I just, there's a lot of Yes Prep folks who are here today, it's great to see you guys and I appreciate you all uh, being here this morning. Um, you know, I recognize in Tennessee this incredible opportunity, and the opportunity was is that you had political leadership um, really making courageous decisions about how to create a great context for public education. And what I mean by that is that you had a governor and a state legislature that were doing things like ending collective bargaining. And while they were doing that the exact same time, it was happening in Wisconsin where it was front page of the news you know, on a daily basis, it was happening under the radar quietly in Tennessee. We lifted the charter cap. We reformed tenure. We rolled out a statewide teacher evaluation system where every single teacher, regardless of whether you teach a non-tested subject or not, has a, uh, an evaluation where 35% of that evaluation is student achievement data. So there was just one thing after another that was happening. And what I recognized was that if this great policy context didn't translate into results on the ground for kids, that it could actually do more harm than good. Because what was gonna happen was all those people that fought every single one of those things tooth and nail were gonna sit back and say, you know what, you got everything you wanted. You got tenure reform, you got collective bargaining take, and nothing changed. And I just felt like there needed to be some people on the ground that could, that could make sure that that change happened. So that's what we set out to do. The Achievement School District was part of Tennessee's Race to the Top application, and it was designed to focus on the schools that are the bottom 5% um, in the state. And I actually do want to pull up one quick slide. So when you look at where the bulk of those 85 schools are on the bottom 5%, you can see that they spread across the three you know, largest urban areas in the state, but the 68 in Memphis jumps off the page. 68 of the 85 schools that are in the bottom 5% in a state that's 47th in the country. So we wake up every morning and thank our lucky stars for Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, and places like West Virginia. 68 of the schools in the bottom 5% were in, in Memphis. So, Right out of the gate, when we start looking at the data, you know, th that, that jumped out as, as both a huge challenge and, and, a, and an opportunity. Um, the second thing was that our charge was to scale pretty quickly. When I interviewed for the job, they said, you know, there's 85 schools in the bottom 5%. And I said, well, if you expect us to take on all 85 schools at once, then I'm not the guy for this job. You know, there's no, it's not a secret why great charter schools open up one grade at a time or two grades at a time. Um, and so we knew that we needed to start small, but if you look by 2014, 2015, we have to scale this thing up to 35 schools pretty quickly. And you know, as, as much as I respect Kai, as much as I respect Cami, and they're by far way smarter than I am, I knew that I was not smart enough to figure out how to get 35 schools that are in the bottom 5% in the state, most of which were in Memphis, how to figure that out by myself. And so what I recognized was both the scale issue and the fact that all the schools were clustered in one place represented an opportunity to create a new kind of school district. And just as Nirav and his colleagues looked around back in 2005 to a model of you know, what is possible and what can we replicate, today in 2012, that urban school district that's knocking out of the park in, in you know, every school, every classroom, unfortunately still doesn't exist. And so where we landed on was how do we create what we're calling a portfolio school district? And what we mean by portfolio school district is that, you know, it's a lot of the principles that, that, uh, that Nir have talked about. We do not need to be in the business necessarily of operating every single school. You know, we, part of our charge and part of our law is that we have the ability to authorize charter schools. And so, you know, given my background and just knowing the great numbers of charters around the country, I felt like the best way we could get to 35 
was for as many of those schools to be charter schools, whether those are schools that were recruiting folks that were recruiting into the state from other places, or how do we, how do we identify the existing charters that are already there because there is a, a healthy charter market in both Nashville and Memphis. How do we find those great leaders and, and help them grow? And how do we find those great teachers and help them open schools? And our job should be a couple things. One, as a district, our job should be to push 100% of the per pupil down to the school. Not the 50% haircut, or the 60% haircut, or the 40% haircut that most schools in a public school district get. We want to push every single dollar down to the school. And then we want to let principals and teachers make decisions about what they do with those dollars. And then our job, in the, in the, in the, we call it the support team, because, you know, just to, you know, it's a little bit of branding, but this idea that the central office is, is central is a joke. The, the central work's not happening in the central office. The central work's happening in the classroom with kids and teachers. And our job is to be the support team. Our job is to support that work, to provide services to the schools, and to do it well enough that the schools actually want to use their per people dollars to buy those services from us. And why we think that's important is because if five years from now we wake up and we've created a school district where there's a curriculum instruction department with 10 or 15 people that write curriculum that nobody cares about or reads, and if there's a, a professional development team with 15 or 20 people that's putting together awful PD that nobody wants to go to, or if they do, it's because they have to and they're rolling their eyes and kicking and screaming the whole way, then we've absolutely missed this opportunity. And so what we believed was, look, Let's come up with every single service that we're going to provide to the schools. Let's cost out what that service looks like. Let's be very transparent about what the service level agreement is for the school to be able to, you know, to, to get those services. And then let's create the decision rights around how they work. And this was actually a, an important lesson that, that, we, that I learned while I was at Yes Prep. Um, you know, at Yes Prep, and, and it may not still be the case, but at least it was last time I was there, we charge a management fee to the schools, right? And it's, you know, eight, eight and a half percent. And while that's absolutely better than what schools get in a district, the challenge with the management fee is it's like the all-you-can-eat buffet, right? You pay $5.99 and you want to load up as much on your plate as you can. And so this, this structure created two challenges. One is either you weren't doing a very good job and the schools were complaining because they didn't think they were getting the service they should for the eight and a half percent. Or, if you were doing a good job, then the schools wanted more and more and more, and you were still stuck with 8.5%. It was like going to the buffet line and loading up and going through the, the, the line three times for your 5.99. And so, you were constantly stuck in this battle where, you know, it was a constant disappointment to the schools. And I think the lesson that we're trying to learn from that and bring to this is, let's be very clear about what the service is, let's be very clear about what the cost is, and this is what you get for X amount, and if you want A, B, and C more, then this is what it costs. And if you don't want to use the services from us, walk down the street and use your per people dollars for something else. But placing those key decisions back in the hands of educators around people and program and time and money, and you can, you know, you can read the slide for yourself, this is what a typical central office does, right? This is what we want to be building in Memphis so that whether it's a school that we're running ourselves or whether it's a charter school that we're bringing into uh, to the city, that we're providing the same level of service and we're actually absolutely agnostic on what kind of operator it is. The, the last thing I'll say is, is this, is that we're, we are just getting started. So there's 85 schools that are in uh, the bottom 5% in Tennessee. We've taken on the first six. Um, this is what we inherited. So if you look at the, where it says 2012 rate, that is the proficiency level for math in those schools. Those are the percentage of kids in the school that are proficient or advanced. Uh, if you kind of go down to the, the, the second yellow column, that's reading language arts. Um, so we have a, a massive challenge in front of us in terms of what it is we have to do. Um, and like I said, you know, as, as much as I have confidence in, in ourselves and our team to, to do this, the only way we're going to get there is by attracting great talent, great charters to the state, and by finding great people who are already there to, to help us do this together. And I think all the principles that Nir have laid out, um, you know, when he when he wrote the letter uh, in, in Ed Week blog and and, uh, 
and coined the term relinquisher, I told him I've got Kool-Aid stains on my mouth from, uh, from drinking the Kool-Aid on the relinquisher. I mean, we're gonna, we wanna relinquish as much of this as we can uh, because we think at the end of the day, it's the only way we're gonna make sure that the schools that are currently in the bottom 5% move to the top 25% in a five-year time period. And that's the goal that we have in front of us and that's what we're setting out to do. Um, we're five weeks in, so hopefully I'll be able to come back in a year and, and report on our progress, but I think we're off to a, a fairly good start and, um, and uh, just happy to be here this morning and share it with you. So I think I'm gonna stop there because I wanna make sure that there's time for, uh, for some Q&A and appreciate the opportunity again, thank you.